Welcome to 2024 and the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter. Welcome to lesson number 11, titled Longing for God in Zion. It's ready for teaching on March 16 and is from the Sabbath School lesson series Psalms, authored by Dr. Dragoslav Sandrak and read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, March 9. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the nuances we gain from the study of the book of Psalms. We thank you for the messages that are there that tell us of your greatness, your love, your grace, and your power. And this week, as we study this week's lesson, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be with us because each of us longs to be in the courts of the Lord. And Lord, we cry out today for the Holy Spirit to guide us and bless us as we open your word. Today, I'd like to pray for families uh, and particularly for Nix's niece and son and uh, Sunshine Isis and her family and Doreen Hines and family and Hazel and Balliston and family and Nasus Seneva and his brother and Victor Kelly of Kenya and family and all of our families. Lord, we each represent a family in one way or another. And I pray that in our understanding of your love and your grace, that we may share your word with those we meet out in the community, but more so with our families. Bless us, we pray, as we open your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Psalm 84 and verse 2. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Let's read that again, Psalm 84, verse 2. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. The songs of Zion are joyous hymns that magnify the beauty of Zion and the sovereignty of the Lord who reigns from his holy mountain. These psalms often praise the merits of the Lord's house and express a love for the sanctuary that can be found in other psalms as well. Many of these psalms were composed by the sons of Korah, who had first-hand experience of the blessedness of the Lord's house as the temple musicians, as we read in 1 Chronicles chapter 6, verses 31 to 38. Now, these are the men whom David appointed over the service of song in the house of the Lord after the ark came to rest. They were ministering with music before the dwelling place of the tabernacle of meeting until Solomon had built the house of the Lord in Jerusalem and they served in their office according to their order. And these are the ones who ministered with their sons. Of the sons of Kohathites were Heman, the singer, the son of Joel, the son of Samuel, the son of Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Eliel, the son of Toa, the son of Zaph, the son of Elkanah, the son of Mahath, the son of Amasai, the son of Elkanah, the son of Joel, the son of Azariah, the son of Zephaniah, the son of Tehath, the son of Asur, the son of Abasaph, the son of Korah, the son of Ishar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, the son of Israel. And they were the keepers of the temple's gates, as we read in First Chronicles 9, verse 19. Shalom, the son of Korah, the son of Abasaph, the son of Korah, and his brethren from his father's house, the Korahites, were in charge of the work of the service, gatekeepers of the temple, tabernacle. Their fathers had been keepers of the entrance to the camp of the Lord. What makes Zion the source of hope and joy? Zion represented God's living presence among his people. As the people of Israel are God's chosen people, as we read in Deuteronomy 7 verse 6, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. So, Zion is God's chosen mountain, as we read in Psalm 78, verse 68. 
but chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved. And Psalm 87 verse 2, The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. God reigns from Zion, we read in Psalm 99 verses 1 and 2, The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He dwells between the cherubim, let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion and he is high above all the peoples. And he's founded his temple on Zion as well, as we read in Psalm 87 verse 1. His foundation is in the holy mountains. Thus, Zion is a place of divine blessings and refuge. Zion is often referred to in parallel or even interchangeably with Jerusalem and the sanctuary, the centre of God's work of salvation for the ancient world. The blessings of Zion overflow to the ends of the earth because the Lord's person and grace exceed the boundaries of any holy place. Zion is the joy of all the earth. We read in Psalm 48 verse 2, Beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king, and affirming that the whole earth belongs to God. Sunday, March 10. A day in your courts is better than a thousand. Read Psalm 84, verses 1 to 4. Why does the psalmist long to dwell in the sanctuary? Psalm 84, beginning with verse 1. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Selah. The psalmist longs and faints to make the sanctuary his permanent abode, so that he can be near God forever, we read in verses 1 and 2. God's living presence, in verse 2, makes the sanctuary a unique place. In the sanctuary, worshippers can behold the beauty of the Lord, as it says in Psalm 27, verse 4. And also we look at Psalm 63, verse 2. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory, and be satisfied with the goodness of his house, we would read in Psalm 65, verse 4. In Psalm 84, unparalleled happiness is achieved in relationship with God, which consists of praising Him in verse 4, finding strength in Him in verse 5, and trusting Him in verse 12. The sanctuary is the place where such a relationship is nourished through worship and fellowship with fellow believers. The living presence of God in the sanctuary gives the worshippers a glimpse of God's glorious kingdom and a taste of eternal life. Read Psalm 84 verses 5 to 12. Who else can be blessed by the sanctuary? Psalm 84 Verse 5, Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage, as they pass through the valley of Baca. They make it spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Salah. O God, beyond our shield, and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. 
God's blessings are described as radiating from the sanctuary, bestowed first on those who serve in the sanctuary in verse 4, then on the pilgrims on their way to the sanctuary in verses 5 to 10, and finally reaching as far as the ends of the earth. The expectation of meeting God in the sanctuary strengthens the faith of the pilgrims in verse 7. Whereas the strength of the ordinary traveller weakens under the burden of the tiresome journey, with the pilgrims to the sanctuary, their strength increases the nearer they come to the sanctuary. Even when physically removed from the sanctuary, God's children continue to bear a stamp of God's sanctuary by living a worthy life, we read in verse 11, which characterizes the righteous who enter the Lord's sanctuary, as we read in Psalm 15, verses 1 and 2. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? He who walks uprightly, and works righteousness, and speaks the truth in his heart. The Lord is called a sun, showing that the blessings from the sanctuary, like the sun rays, extend to the ends of the earth, we read in Psalm 84 verse 11. Thus those who abide with God through faith receive his grace, regardless of the place where they are. And so to finish the day, read Revelation 21, verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. What hope reflected in the earthly sanctuary is revealed here to us. How do we now even begin to imagine what this experience will be like? Monday, March 11. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Read Psalm 122, verses 1 to 5. What are the sentiments of the worshippers upon their arrival to Jerusalem? What do they hope to find in Jerusalem? Psalm 122, verses 1 to 5. I was glad when they said to me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing without your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together, where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to the testimony of Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord, for thrones are set there for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Psalm 122 expresses the pilgrims' delight and excitement upon their arrival at Jerusalem. The pilgrimages to Jerusalem were joyful occasions when God's people joined three times during the year to commemorate God's goodness toward them in the past and the present, as you read in Deuteronomy 16.16. 16, three times a year all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place where he chooses, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Tabernacles, and they shall not not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Jerusalem was the centre of the nation's life because it contained the testimony of Israel, as it said in verse 4, and the thrones of four judgment, as it said in verse 5. The testimony of Israel refers to the sanctuary that was at times called the tabernacle of the testimony in Numbers chapter 1 and verse 50. But you shall appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of the testimony, over all its furnishings and over all things that belong to it. They shall carry the tabernacle and all its furnishings. They shall attend to it and camp around the tabernacle. And it contained the ark of the testimony, as you read in Exodus 25 verse 22. And there I will meet with you and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. The thrones 
set for judgment, depict the judicial system of Jerusalem, as we read in 2 Samuel 8 verse 15. So David reigned over all Israel, and David administered judgment and justice to all his people. Pilgrimage was thus the time when one could seek and obtain justice. Faithfulness to God and administering justice to people were never to be separated. Read Psalm 122, verses 6 to 9. What is the main prayer of God's people? Psalm 122, beginning at verse 6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls. Prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brethren and companions, I will now say, Peace be within you. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Praying for the peace of Jerusalem invokes God's blessings upon the city and its inhabitants, and it unites the worshippers, causing peace to spread among them, as we read in verse 8. Jerusalem could be the city of peace only if peace existed between God and his people, and among God's children themselves. Thus, prayer for the peace of Jerusalem conveys an appeal to God's people to live in peace with God and one another. In Jerusalem's peace, the people will prosper, as you read in Psalm 147, verses 12 to 14. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion, for he has strengthened the bars of your gates. He has blessed your children within you. He makes peace in your borders and fills you with the finest wheat. The psalm teaches us that the prayer for the well-being of the community of faith should be the main subject of the prayers of God's children because only the strong and united people of God can proclaim the good tidings of God's peace and salvation to the world, as you read in John 13, verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Praying for the peace of Jerusalem is still a privilege and responsibility of the believers because it keeps alive the hope in the end time coming of God's kingdom of peace, which will embrace not only the city of Jerusalem, but the whole world, as you read in Isaiah 52, verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. And Isaiah 66, verses 12 and 13. For thus says the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. Then you shall feed. On her sides shall you be carried, and be dandled on her knees. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you, and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. And then we read this in Revelation 21. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then, in verse 5, he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. 
And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And then Revelation 22, beginning at verse 1, and we'll finish at verse 5. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, and on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign for ever and ever. And so to finish the day, what are practical ways that we can strive for harmony among us as a people now? Tuesday, March 12. Zion, the home of all nations. Read Psalm 87, verses 1 and 2. What makes Zion such an esteemed place? Psalm 87, beginning at verse 1. His foundation is in the holy mountains. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Psalm 87 is a hymn celebrating Zion as God's specially chosen and beloved city. The foundation of God's temple is on Mount Zion. We read in Psalm 2, verse 6, Yet I will set my king on my holy hill of Zion. And Psalm 15, verse 1, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle, who may dwell in your holy hill? At the end of time, Zion will rise above all mountains, signifying the Lord's sovereign supremacy over the whole world. As you read in Psalm 99, verse 2, The Lord is great in Zion. He is high above all the peoples. And Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. And Micah chapter 4, verse 1, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and peoples shall flow to it. Psalm 87 refers to Zion as mountains to highlight its majesty, as we also see in Psalm 133, verse 3. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. God loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob, we read in verse 2 of Psalm 87, expressing the superiority of Zion over all other places in Israel that were special gathering places of God's people in the past, such as Shiloh and Bethel. Thus, the psalm affirms that true worship of God is in his chosen place and in his prescribed way. Read Psalm 87 verses 3 to 7. What are the glorious things that are spoken of Zion? Psalm 87 beginning at verse 3. Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God, Salah. I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to those who know me. Behold, O Philistia and Tyre, with Ethiopia, this one was born there. And of Zion it will be said, This one and that one were born in her, and the Most High himself shall establish her. The Lord will record when he registers the peoples, This one was born there, Selah. Both the singers and the players of instruments say, All my springs are in you. 
The glory of Zion draws all the nations to God, and so the borders of God's kingdom are extended to include the whole world. Notice that God does not treat the other nations as second-level citizens, even if Zion is portrayed as the spiritual birthplace of all peoples who accept the Lord as their saviour. The registering of individuals was done according to their birthplace, as we see in Nehemiah 7 verse 5, Then my God put it into my heart to gather the nobles, the rulers, and the people, that they might be registered by genealogy. And I found a register of the genealogy of those who had come up in the first return and found written in it. And then Luke 2, verses 1 to 3, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Three times the psalm states that the nations are born in Zion, meaning that the Lord provides them with a new identity and grants them all the privileges of lawfully born children of Zion, as we actually read in Psalm 87 and verse 4 to 6. I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to those who know me. Behold, O Philistia and Tyre, with Ethiopia, this one was born there. And of Zion it will be said, This one and that one were born in her, and the Most High himself shall establish her. The Lord will record when he registers the peoples, This one was born there. Selah. Psalm 87 points to salvation of both the Jews and the Gentiles and their being united in one church through Christ's redeeming ministry. As we read in Romans 3 verse 22, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. And Romans 10 verse 12, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. And Galatians 3 verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And Colossians 3 verse 11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. The psalm's portrayal of the prosperity of Zion is reminiscent of Daniel's vision of God's kingdom becoming an enormous mountain that fills the whole earth. In Daniel chapter 2, verses 34 and 35, you watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were crushed together and and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And verses 44 and 45. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. And of Jesus' parable about God's kingdom growing into a huge tree that hosts the birds of the air in Matthew 13 and verse 32, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. And so to finish today, 
How does Zion's readiness to adopt all people find its fulfilment in the Church's great commission to preach the gospel to every nation recorded in Matthew 28 verses 18 to 20? And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. How does this idea fit in with our call to preach the three angels' messages? Wednesday, March 13, Safety and Peace of Zion Read Psalm 46, verses 1 to 7. How is the world poetically depicted here? Let's begin at verse 1 of Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed. And though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, Selah. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Salah. This psalm gives a vivid description of the world in turmoil and it is portrayed with the images of natural disasters of unprecedented intensity in verses 2 and 3. The image of disturbed waters often depicts the rebellious nations and various problems that the wicked cause in the world. As we see in Psalm 93 verses 3 and 4, The floods have lifted up, O Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their waves. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, than the mighty waves of the sea. And Psalm 124 verses 2 to 5. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us alive, when their wrath was kindled against us. Then the waters would have overwhelmed us. The stream would have gone over our soul. Then the swollen waters would have gone over our soul. Likewise, in Psalm 46, the images of natural calamities depicts the world controlled by nations waging wars, as it said in verse 6 of Psalm 46. It is clearly a world without the knowledge of God because God is in the midst of his people and where God dwells, peace abounds, as we read in verses 4 and 5. Let's just read those two Verses again, verses 4 and 5 of Psalm 46. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. Yet, although the world rejects him, God does not abandon the world. God is present in the world by being among his people. In other words, no matter how bad things appear, God's presence is here in the world and we can draw personal hope and encouragement from knowing this foundational truth. The Lord, who is the perfect refuge, is the source of Zion's lasting peace and security. The word that highlights the security of Zion is though in Psalm 46 verse 3. Though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, Salah. Though the world is in turmoil, the people of God are safe. This shows that peace is not the result of total absence of trials, but God's gift to his trusting children. 
Unreserved trust in God can render God's child peaceful and secure in the middle of the storm. As we read in that illustration in Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 to 27. Now when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with the waves. But he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be, that even the winds and the sea obey him? The question that poses itself is, will God leave the world to its destructive choices and actions forever? Read Psalm 46 verses 6 to 11. What is God's response to violence and destruction in the world? Psalm 46 beginning at verse 6. The nations raged, the kingdoms were moved, he uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Salah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Salah. God responds with such a force of displeasure that his word, which had created the earth, now causes the earth to melt. We saw in verse 6, the nations raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. Yet, The melting does not end in destruction, but renewal. Notice that God extends his peace from Zion to the ends of the earth. God will make wars cease and extinguish the tools of destruction which the wicked nations use to bring oppression upon the world. As we read in verse 9, he makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. This is the great hope that Christians have, which will occur at the second coming of Jesus. And so to finish the day, how do we learn to have peace and to trust God amid a world that indeed has so much turmoil? Thursday, March 14, Immovable Like Mount Zion Read Psalm 125, verses 1 and 2. How are those who trust God portrayed here? Psalm 125, beginning at verse 1. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forevermore. Those who trust in the Lord are compared to Mount Zion, the symbol of steadfastness and strength. The magnificent view of the mountains surrounding the city of Jerusalem inspired the psalmist to acknowledge the certainty of divine protection. In Psalm 5 and verse 12, For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous with favour. You will surround him as with a shield. And Psalm 32, Two verses 7, You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. Selah. And verse 10, Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Unlike the mountains ruled by the wicked, which are being tossed into the seas in Psalm 46 verse 2, therefore we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, the impressive durability of the mountain upon which Jerusalem was built inspires profound trust. The confidence in God's protection becomes even bolder in the face of the painful reality in which evil seems to prevail so often. Yet, even amid that evil, God's people can have hope. 
Read Psalm 125, verses 3 to 5. How are the righteous tempted? What is the lesson for us? Psalm 125, beginning at verse 3. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous reach out their hands to iniquity. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good, and to those who are upright in their hearts. As for such as turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord shall lead them away with the workers of iniquity." God's children can be discouraged by the success of the wicked and perhaps tempted to follow their ways, as we read in Psalm 73, verses 2 to 13. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm." They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride serves as their necklace, violence covers them like a garment, their eyes bulge with abundance, they have more than heart could wish, they scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression, they speak loftily, they set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore his people return here. The waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, How does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly, who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. And Psalm 94 and verse 3, Lord, how long will the wicked, how long will the wicked triumph? The utmost stability of Mount Zion cannot secure those who depart from the Lord. The people are still given freedom to put forth their hands into iniquity, we read in Psalm 125 verse 3, and turn aside unto their crooked ways in verse 5. The Lord is just and will judge the individuals who remain in rebellion along with other unrepentant sinners. Here is the call for God's people to remain immovable in faith and trust in the Lord, just as Mount Zion is their immovable refuge. That is, even when we don't understand things, we can still trust in the goodness of God. We read in Steps to Christ, page 106 and 107, the entrance of sin into the world, the incarnation of Christ, regeneration, the resurrection, and many other subjects presented in the Bible are mysteries too deep for the human mind to explain, or even fully to comprehend. But we have no reason to doubt God's Word, because we cannot understand the mysteries of His providence. Everywhere are wonders beyond our ken. Should we then be surprised to find that in the spiritual world also there are mysteries that we cannot fathom? The difficulty lies solely in the weakness and narrowness of the human mind. God has given us in the Scriptures sufficient evidence of their divine character, and we are not to doubt His Word because we cannot understand all the mysteries of His providence. End of quote. Friday, March 15. Further thought. Contemplate the message of Isaiah 40 and Isaiah 51 verses 1 to 16. Let's read Isaiah 40 beginning at verse 1. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth.' 
The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The voice said, Cry out, and he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem. You who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand, and his arm will rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm, and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those who are with young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span, and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or his counsellor has taught him? With whom did he take counsel, and who instructed him and taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are a drop in a bucket and are counted as the small dust on the scales. Look, he lifts up the isles as a very little thing, and Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor its beasts sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted by him less than nothing and worthless. To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare to him? The workman moulds an image, the goldsmith overspreads it with gold, and the silversmith casts silver chains. Whoever is too impoverished for such a contribution chooses a tree that will not rot. He seeks for himself a skilful workman to prepare a carved image that will not totter. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits upon the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. Scarcely shall they be planted. Scarcely shall they be sown. Scarcely shall their stock take root in the earth when he will also blow on them and they will wither and the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. To whom then will you liken me? Or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God. Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And then Isaiah 51, verses 1 to 16. Listen to me, you who follow after righteousness, who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the hole of the pit from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father. And to Sarah who bore you, for I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. He will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in it, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. 
Listen to me, my people. O oh, give ear to me, O oh, my nation, for law will proceed from me, and I will make my justice rest as a light of the peoples. My righteousness is near, my salvation has gone forth, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands will wait upon me, and on my arm they will trust. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look on the earth beneath. For the heavens will vanish away like smoke, the earth will grow old like a garment, and those who dwell in it will die in like manner. For my salvation will be for ever, and my righteousness will not be be abolished. Listen to me, you who know righteousness, you people in whose heart is my law. Do not fear the reproach of men, nor be afraid of their insults. For the moth will eat them up like a garment, and the worm will eat them like wool. But my righteousness will be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the ancient days, in the generations of old. Are you not the arm that cut Rahab apart and wounded the serpent? Are you not the one who dried up the sea? the waters of the great deep, that made the depths of the sea a road for the redeemed to cross over. So the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness. Sorrow and sighing shall flee away. I, even I, am he who comforts you. Who are you that you should be afraid of a man who will die? and of the son of a man who will be made like grass. And you forget the Lord your Maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. You have feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor, when he has prepared to destroy. And where is the fury of the oppressor? The captive exile hastens that he may be loosed. Then he shall not die in the pit, and that his bread should not fail. But I am the Lord your God, who divided the sea, whose waves roared. The Lord of hosts is his name. And I have put my words in your mouth. I have covered you with the shadow of my hand, that I may plant the heavens, lay the foundations of the earth, and say to Zion, You are my people. The songs of Zion make an absolute commitment to staying mindful of Zion and the living hope in God's sovereign reign that it represents. While many blessings of God's sanctuary are experienced in this life, the hope in the fullness of life and joy in Zion is still in the future. Many of God's children long for the heavenly Zion with tears, as you read in Psalm 137, verse 1. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. To remember Zion implies not merely an occasional thought, but also a deliberate mindfulness and decision to live in accordance with that living memory. As we read in Exodus 13.3, And Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you went out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand the Lord brought you out of this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. And Exodus 20, verse 8, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Therefore, singing the songs of Zion carries a passionate resolve to keep alive the hope in the restoration of God's kingdom on the new earth, as we read in Revelation 21, verses 1 to 5. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, 
for these words are true and faithful. In The Great Controversy, page 677, we read, There immortal minds will contemplate with never-failing delight the wonders of creative power, the mysteries of redeeming love. There is no cruel, deceiving foe to tempt to forgetfulness of God. Every faculty will be developed, every capacity increased, the acquirement of knowledge will not weary the mind or exhaust the energies. There the grandest enterprises may be carried forward, the loftiest aspirations reached, the highest ambitions realised, and still there will arise new heights to surmount, new wonders to admire, new truths to comprehend, fresh objects to call forth the powers of the mind and soul and body. End of quote. A commitment not to forget Zion is an implicit pledge of the Lord's pilgrims that they will never accept this world as their homeland, but await the new heavens and the new earth. Thus, the Psalms of Zion can be sung by believers of all generations who long to live in the new Jerusalem. As you read in Revelation 3, verse 12, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from God and I will write on him my new name. The songs of Zion encourage us to anticipate the future world with hope, but they also oblige us to be agents of God's grace in this present world. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. One, how do we take the spiritual and theological principles that centred on God's people in Zion, a literal place in Jerusalem, and apply them to the church and its mission to the world? Two, how can believers abide in God's sanctuary today? Well, first of all, we'll look at John 1, verses 14 to 18. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me, and his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. And Hebrews 12, verses 22 to 24. But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. And question three, how will Zion become the city of all nations as envisioned in Psalm 87? Well, we'll look at Romans 5 verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And Ephesians 2, 11 to 16. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcised, by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one 
and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enemy and Colossians 1 verses 19 to 23 for it pleased the father that in him all the fullness should dwell and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him whether things on earth or things in heaven having made peace through the blood of his cross and you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. And question four. How do you answer the person who points to the reality of the wicked prospering in this world, while many good people suffer. What do you say? Why is it important to acknowledge that we don't have full answers for everything here and now? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Skin and Bones, Part 7 by Andrew McChesney Returning to the barracks after a short stint of shoveling coal on a mountain, Sukule informed his commander that he would not bear arms, even in the ongoing Bosnian war. I don't want to shoot people, he said. You must take a weapon, the commander insisted. Otherwise you will have to serve two years instead of one. Non-combatants were required to serve two years rather than one in the army. I don't care, Sukule said. I won't carry a weapon. The commander sent Sekule to an intelligence officer. Only soldiers who were in deep trouble were sent to the officer. He could imprison soldiers. Sekule explained his position to the officer. Fine, the officer said. Take a gun, and if you are sent to the front, give it back. That way you will serve only one year instead of two. What do you mean, Sekule said. Agree to carry a gun during training, but the training that you will receive will be on tell printers instead of the shooting range, the officer said. Sukule agreed. He was assigned to office work, helping run military communications by typing on a teleprinter. The Sabbath turned out to be a bigger challenge than guns for Sukule. Because of the ward, Sukule needed to be trained quickly to work on a teleprinter, but he refused to attend training sessions on Sabbath. Food also was a challenge. Military rations were prepared with lard. Sukule's parents refused to send money for food because they hoped he would change his diet. Sukule prayed, Please bless me like you blessed Daniel. He decided not to eat unclean food, and I want to do the same. Sukule's commander didn't know what to do. You won't work on Saturday, he asked. No, Sukule said. Do you have any suggestions about what we can do? No, you won't eat meat? No. Do you have any suggestions about what we can do? No. The only thing Sukule could eat was bread and tea. In four months, he lost 50 pounds, which is 23 kilos, dropping to 137 pounds, which is 85 kilos. He was skin and bones. <laughs> 